Good afternoon. I want to remind everyone to uh, please silence their cell phones and other mobile devices. Also, a uh, reminder that flash photography is not permitted. Video recording is also not permitted, and anyone looking for video, please visit the distribution site in the back of the room. Media reminded that uh, a microphone is around the room in different spots. Please um, request it. I'll make sure one gets your way. Identify yourself by name and affiliation and uh, make sure to please direct your quote to a specific student athlete the best way possible. You can find transcripts of these press conferences at nca.com slash transcripts. Press conferences will also be available via satellite feed at the following coordinates, which is Galaxy 17 Transponder 19B. The downlink frequency is 12075.50. H. All student athletes not participating in our press conference today are also available in their respective locker rooms for 30 minutes. Uh, at the same time, the coaches and student players are available here. Uh, Purdue is currently in the Pistons locker room for today. Student athletes will be here for from 135 to 155. Uh, and then after that, head coach Matt Painter will be joining us from 155 to 215. Purdue's locker room is now open to the media for the next 30 minutes.
Joining us today from Purdue is Vincent Edwards and Dakota Mathias. Uh, remember to ask for the microphone and uh, state your affiliation and name before asking a specific question. Questions for the student athletes. Curious, next opponents, obviously Butler, a team you guys are familiar with. You played them earlier this season. The campus is not far from yours. I'm curious, how, how well do you know the guys who play for that team? And, and you know, do you follow them at all? I know they're in a different conference, but do you sort of pay attention to how they're doing as the season goes along? Yeah, you know, we're definitely familiar with them, obviously, being so close. Um, you know, a lot of those guys are from Indy, and I think you know, in the summer times, you know, we work out with them, a couple of guys, open gyms, things like that. Um, you know, so we're very familiar with them, and you know, due to that, we – I personally, you know, follow them throughout the season and you know how they're doing. And um, I got pretty close with Keelan Martin this summer, you know, just working out together. And yeah, so we definitely follow their progress and how they've been doing. What was your guys' reaction to uh, Isaac being ruled out for the rest of the season with the elbow injury? How hard was that for you guys being seniors as well? I mean, it's just, it wasn't as hard for us as it was for him. We had to be there for him and keep our heads up. So. We're not going to walk around here with our heads down. You know, our focus is on Butler. You know, we've dealt with injuries before. These guys have picked this team up when I was out, so we plan on doing the same thing. Uh, yes, uh, David Woods from the Indianapolis Star. Uh, for both Dakota <coughs> and Vincent, you know, like a lot of teams, uh, Butler seems to have some of its best games when they're, when they're making their threes. Um, how did you guys defend uh, Butler and, and the three last time? What was so effective about that? And just how have, uh, how have you dealt with uh, good three-point shooting teams that, you know, generally throughout the season? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, the first time we played them, especially in the first half, we were very active um, with our hands. I think we kind of disrupted the flow of their offense. We made things, you know, pretty tough for them. Um, and whenever you get out of a rhythm like that, it's tough, you know, to kind of rebound. So, um, like you said, you know, they're a great three-point shooting team. So just making them feel uncomfortable is going to be the biggest thing for us. I mean, yeah, I would say the same thing that he just says. Just we're really active in the first half, uh, and we were able to get a lot of the loose balls and get our hands, you know, on deflections and passing lines and things like that. So when you can disrupt someone's rhythm and the flow of their offense, it makes it tough. Isaac came back in the game yesterday after the injury, and he was joking around. He seemed like he was in great spirits in the locker room. How big of a shock was that to everybody? And what did you say to him to try to lift him up? Yeah, I mean, obviously. You know, we didn't expect that, um, those results. But um, you know, he's a tough kid. You know, he's battled a lot. And you know, we, we just wanted to let him know that we were there for him. Obviously, being a senior like that, it's tough to handle. But um, you know, he's our brother. He's our family. So we just wanted to let him know we were there for him. Yeah, just piggyback on the same thing. Uh, me and Isaac have had some, you know, some rough patches throughout our relationship and career. But definitely like a guy I've grown closer with. And just like these guys being in that senior class and not being able to actually, you know, walk out on the court with him, knowing his senior year ended the way it did, it sucks for him. And, um, you know, like I said, we're not going to hang our heads on it, though. We're going to be there in spirits, and he's going to be our biggest cheerleader. So we're going to go out and play for him. Any additional questions for the student athletes? Did I, did I shout out Lil B? Oh, um, if Lil B is watching this, shout out to Lil B for uh, blessing us with his presence. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. Purdue Locker Room is uh, open until 2.06, uh, and head coach Matt Painter will be joining us momentarily.
College. Congratulations, Sales. Thank you. Now joined by Purdue head coach Matt Painter. Uh, we'll have him start with a opening statement before we start with questions. Um, obviously excited to be able to move on. I thought our guys played really well in the second half, had some really good energy, um, got some stops, made some good plays. We're uh, a little bit too eager in the first half of our game yesterday, I thought. Um, took some, some kind of ill-advised shots early, kind of some quick shots, and really didn't probe the defense. Thought we did it much better in the second half. And our guys um, really played much better, played together, played hard, took what the defense gave them, um, got some quality stops. We know we have a tough test um, against Butler. And uh, they have a great program um, through the years. And Laval's done an unbelievable job um, with this team. You know, Baldwin and Martin are, are very, very difficult to stop. But it's, it's really more than them. They uh, out-rebounded Arkansas yesterday by 20, play hard, stingy on defense, do a good job of getting their hands um, in passing lanes and on the ball, and just being active, just being around the ball, just a really good all-around basketball team. Questions for Coach. Microphones are around the room. Remember to state your affiliation and name as well. Coach, Kevin Goheen with uh, Land of 10. There's a report out that uh, Isaac did practice today. He's had, had a brace. Is, is that the case? And uh, what, what's it going forward? Yeah, he ran up and down today, did, did a few things and worked out. I don't, I don't see him playing, though. Uh, uh, David Woods from the Indianapolis Star. Butler, like really most college basketball teams, is is much better when they're when they're making their threes and and most of their, a lot of their big wins they were making threes. How was Purdue so effective in kind of neutralizing that the first time and and uh, just how have you defended? Have you been pretty successful at defending the three uh, on on a year long basis or do you have like a special philosophy or strategy <sighs> you do to guard the arc? Um, I, I wish I did have a special philosophy. I think it's it's different with different schemes. Um, sometimes you feel like you're doing a good job, like against Butler by the numbers in the first game. You know, it looks like we did a good job. Or is it just wasn't their day? You know, sometimes guys that shoot the basketball, like Kamar Baldwin, you go back and watch tape, he had a handful of shots he normally makes, you know, and he didn't make it. So that, you know, that helps us. You go watch him against Seton Hall in the Big East tournament, and they're just draped all over him, and he just makes tough shots. And so sometimes it's just your day. I think that day you know, was ours. But we try to, you know, to do a good job of uh, guarding the arc, but also not exposing ourselves to where now we're not containing the dribble, and they're getting to the free throw line, getting easy twos. Because sometimes guarding the arc means they get by you, and now they still penetrate and pitch and still get a good three. So um, they, they have some tough matchups for everybody. So it's going to be really important for us um, that we do a good job and stay out of rotations. Matt, back to Isaac for a second. After the game yesterday, he was joking around in the locker room, seemed to be in great spirits. And then the rumor was it was mandatory surgery, and now he's back. Can you talk about the emotional roller coaster yeah. of the last 24 hours? And if he's not able to play tomorrow, is it your understanding that this condition could get better at some point during the tournament? No, he's not going to, you know, he's fractured his elbow. So he, he can go out there and, and get warm ups and do things, but I, I don't think he's going to play. Um, I'm obviously not a doctor, but I've been able to look at it and see that. Um, so he just went through things today and just, you know, getting loose and everything. So his, his legs aren't broke, so you're allowed to still run when your elbow's fractured. Mark, you really have trouble handling the emotional swings of yeah. this with your team and this senior class. Can you talk about what that's been like? Yeah, it's not an emotional swing for us. You know, we, we just prepare for Butler. And so when Vince Edwards went out, um, and we had to play two conference games. We won those games. And, you know, you focus on what you have. You don't focus on what you don't have. And it's no different than foul trouble. You know, Isaac plays half the game for us. You know, we're, we're used to playing half the game without him. So now we just got to play a full game without him. Uh, Greg Gershman, New York Post. If Isaac can't go, what do you see from Matt Harms that obviously he's played a good amount, but right. stepping into that starter role, uh, what do you see from him that, that gives you that confidence he can, can step in? Yeah, well, Matt's played the whole year. You know, he's done a good job for us. He played 27 minutes in the game versus Butler um, when we played earlier in the season. So, um, you know, he's long, he's athletic, he can run, he can block shots, he knows what's going on. Um, the game matters to him. So um, it's a great opportunity for him to, to be able to step up and stay in his role, you know, be really good at being Matt Harms. You don't have to be something else. And um, I think that's going to be important for, for us, that he brings that energy and, and helps us get going on both ends of the court. 
Coach, not a lot of uh, international players end up at Purdue over the years. How did Matt end up on your radar, and how did he end up coming to uh, West Lafayette? Right. Well, he played at uh, Sunrise Christian, so just seeing him in AAU and then kind of following up, he was a little bit of a under-the-radar guy. You know, he wasn't um, a guy at, at his high school that was, you know, averaging 20 and 15, and um, but he was really skinny, and so he's gained about 25 pounds since he's been at our place. But we were very fortunate. I think you hear a lot of stories as coaches when you recruit somebody for three years and then you lose out, you know, to somebody and you get upset about that. Say, we put in all this time and you put in no time and you get the player. Well, we were on the back end of that one to where we didn't recruit him for a long period of time. And then when we went into recruiting, he liked us. He knew everything about us. He watched us a lot um, on television. And uh, he knew everything about our program and the development of our big guys. And so it was one of those rare moments where the exposure that you're getting internationally and uh, just the exposure and the understanding that he had of the development of our bigs really helped us land him. Coach, how similar is this situation uh, with Isaac in, in terms of uh, 2010 with Robbie? And, and what did you learn from then? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, we still had three games in conference season when Rob tore his ACL. So we had three conference games. We had two tournament games. And then we obviously had three NCAA tournament games. So it gave us a little bit of time to prepare. And it's interesting you said that. I just watched one of our games in the NCAA tournament because it was on the Big Ten Network against um, Texas A&M to go to the Sweet 16. It, j it just makes you run some things differently. Rob made things work for us. Um, we don't run anything differently. Um, we run a lot of things for Isaac, but we also run things for other people. Whereas we ran a lot more motion at the time. We'd isolate Juwan Johnson. We'd isolate um, Etuan Moore a lot in some ball screen action. Um, so we had to change some things. We, we had to change a lot. And uh, we didn't shoot the ball as well when Rob um, didn't play. And the guys that, that stepped in there who were good shooters still didn't shoot the ball well. So that's a big part of it. It kind of goes back to what David said before is like, you know, how good Butler is when they make their shots. And that's it's kind of a profound statement. It's how good anybody is that relies on three pointers. And so I think that's going to be key more than anything, just us running our stuff, sticking with it. But we had a lot of turnovers the first time against Butler, you know, with Isaac Haas. You know, it's, it's going to be important that we play this game and not turn the basketball over and be able to rebound and just kind of focus on those things. I know you said it's unlikely, but is there a chance that Isaac would even dress tomorrow? I would think he dresses and goes to warm-ups. I would think he wants to do that to kind of, you know, stay connected and stuff. But I don't think he'll play. Is there a brace that he would have to wear? Yes. Okay. Yes. He'd have to get that approved. I don't want to harp on this, but down the road, is this something you could see it would have to be surgically repaired or would it heal itself? No, no, they said it has to be, you have to have surgery. Any additional coach questions for coach? Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Next press conference will be Butler at 2.20 when their student athletes join us. Uh, Purdue's locker room still remains open until 2.06.
was that? It, um, I think so. Let me check. Butler's locker room is open. They are in the officials' locker room. Um, they're open for 30 minutes. Just a reminder, most everybody was here for the first one, but just remember to silence your cell phones, no flash photography. Video recording is also not permitted. And if you need video, please visit the distribution site in the back of the room. Joining us this morning will be uh, from Butler student athletes, Kamar Baldwin, uh, Keelan Martin, and Tyler Weidman. Once they get here, we'll also then have questions for them for letting them go back to the locker room. The locker room will remain open after that for, 30, for the remainder of the 30 minute window. Guys, welcome. We're joined this afternoon by the student athletes from Butler. We'll open it up for questions from the audience. Stacy Clarity with goldenblack.com. If you could just maybe all speak to this, how does Purdue different without Isaac Hoff? We'll start uh, with Kamar and then go down the line. Um, you know, he's a big body. You know, uh, I don't know if he's going to play or not, but, uh, you know, they're a really good team uh, with him or without him. So uh, we're just going to prepare uh, either way and be ready to go tomorrow. Um, yeah, pretty much what he said. Uh, they have another big guy also, so uh, he protects the rim. So there's just another big body out there for them. Um, yeah, like they said, they do a good job of uh, using their bigs if he's in or out. So, I mean, they're still a good team regardless of who's playing or who's on the court. Go right ahead. Tyler, do you think it helps having the familiarity of playing, having played these guys already? I mean, sometimes in the NCAAs, you kind of hope you have that, you know, we haven't played you before, you haven't, can't prepare like that, but it's different with this, this matchup. Uh, yeah, I think it helps a little. Um, I think it helps the coaching staff with their uh, scouting, so they already have stuff on those guys. Um, but, I mean, that was a long time ago, so I really don't remember too much from the game, but uh, I think any team you play at this point, you just know they're a good team and, and for a good game. Any other questions for the student athletes? All right, guys. Locker room is open. We'll be joined by Butler's head coach in just a little bit.
Coach, welcome. Yeah. Great. Thanks. We're now joined by Butler head coach Laval Jordan. We'll open it up with a comment from him before we take questions from the media. And when we do, just remember to uh, open it up with your name and affiliation first. Um, thanks. Uh, obviously, it's a um, it's an exciting thing to uh, to still have games to coach at this point, and uh, for our for our team to still be a uh, playing and playing, competing for a championship. Uh, as you're watching games, I think you know, one of the best parts of uh, this time of year is when you win and you kind of have the next day to watch others, uh, other games and knowing right, you're still going to play uh, the day after. And so um, you know, our guys are excited and we've got a, a, a tough task ahead of us with Purdue. I was, I was proud of how we competed yesterday and you know, watching the film back, I thought we executed fairly well. Uh, we've seen Purdue, uh, you know, earlier this season, and so we've got some film to draw upon to try to correct some of those mistakes. Uh, and we'll work on and, and talk about that over the next, you know, 24 hours. Questions? Terry Hutchins with CNHI Sports Indiana. Coach, so first talk about uh, uh, Carson Edwards and – you know, uh, how his role has changed since the first time you played him and then just what makes him such a difficult player to stop? Yeah, I don't know if his his role has changed. I think he's just, um, his confidence has grown to, to such a high level uh, as, you, as you continue to watch him uh, develop. You know, he, he's always been a very aggressive uh, player and I think he's he's dynamic. You know, he, he's, he's one of the guys that, um, you know, across the country that, uh, his athleticism, his speed to get to the rim, and then he's got – you look up and he's got 93s made, you know, on the season, which is a high number. I think Keelan Martin's got – he just got over 90 yesterday. And so that that's an elite-level shooter. Uh, and they've got two of them, him and Dakota Mathias. And so, um, you know, they they move him around well. He's, he's, a, he's a load in transition up the court. Uh, and then, you know, defensively, uh, you know, their team is, is really good defensively, but he's got the ability to, to shoot some lanes and steal some passes. So uh, he causes some havoc on that in the floor of, as, as well. It's, uh, David Woods from the Indianapolis Star. Uh, Laval, Butler, perhaps more than some other teams, uh, you know, has a huge influence when you guys are hitting threes. Uh, some of your best wins have been when you're, when you're making them. What are the components that allows you to do that? Is it is it from uh, is it from scheme? Is it from what op opposition gives you? Is it how you're defending? I mean, wh what are kind of the how you're moving the ball? What are kind of the things if you notice the theme through the season allowing you to do that? Yeah, um, I, I think you know, and I agree with you. When we're when we're at our best, um, you know, we're getting you know a good percentage of shots made from three. Um, you know how we get them is is important. I think when we're playing inside out, um, you know that that's critical to um, to our shot percentage going up from three. You know, whether that's attacking the paint, uh, off the dribble, throwing it into the post, uh, and our ball movement. And, you know, early on in the year, it wasn't as crisp, it wasn't as fluid uh, as it's, as it's gotten over the course of uh, this season. Uh, and we have to have that. And then I think the other the other formula for us, part of the formula for us, is uh, transition. And I thought we got pretty good looks in transition yesterday. We made them early. We had a spell kind of when they made their run where we missed a few. Uh, and then we made a few big ones late. I know Key made a, Keelan made a big one off of steal, you know, up the court late. And, and so, um, you know, we can't get three ball dependent. Uh, and, and that's not who we are. But, you know, when we've got a good balance, you know, we're, we're pretty good. Me if you've already answered this question, but a few weeks ago you put uh, Sean McDermott back into the uh, starting lineup. What have you seen in his play since coming back from the ankle injury, and how does having him in the starting lineup change the dynamics of the team? Yeah, you know, Shawnee, he had a terrific off season. Uh, I thought he prepared himself well to to have a um, to have a big role this year. Uh, and then as we got into um, the start of the non-conference, you know, he came out really strong. Uh, he was shooting the ball really well from three. Uh, he was making plays offensively. He was a big part of it. Uh, and then defensively, you know, he, he's got length uh, and he's got an IQ. And so uh, after he was injured, we went small with three guards. And uh, it was really good for us offensively as well. But, we, you know, we were smaller at position. Um, and I think the Providence game was when Sean came back into the starting lineup. Uh, and they're 6'6", 6'7", 6'8", everywhere. 
Uh, so it was more of a matchup based thing at that at that point in time. Um, and then we just kind of stuck with it. Uh, I think Paul Paul came in with great energy off the bench, uh, and he had, he wasn't doing so great uh, leading up to that game. And he had a couple good games in a row. Just uh, gave us more scoring off the bench, um, you know, than, than than bringing Sean off. And so uh, we just stuck with that lineup. And I think defensively, uh, it, it's really helped us just to have a little more length on the court. Stacy Clarity with Golden Black. In the first matchup against Purdue, it was maybe one of their best defensive halves of the year in that first half. You mentioned they're a good team. What makes Purdue a good defensive team? Uh, well, they, they, you know, they, they've got the ability to um, – some teams can't pressure without giving up, you know, great looks. Uh, and, and they've got – you know, they're really well coached where they can put, apply a ton of pressure, uh, ball pressure on the perimeter. Uh, and still keep you, you know, from getting a wide open drive kick threes. Now, part a lot of that's due to uh, they've got rim protectors at the basket. Uh, when Haas is in there uh, and the other kids in there, he blocks shots, and so you're, you're forced to drive into them. Uh, and then I think they're really smart. Uh, I, I think they got high IQ guys with Dakota and PJ Thompson and Vince Edwards, uh, and so those guys and they're veterans. Uh, so they cover for each other when when some guy. You know, is over on a rotation. They kind of pick it up on the backside, and uh, next thing you know, you're taking difficult shot clock shots. Back to the back to Carson, but uh, well, in terms of matchups, is that something that that Baldwin starts out on him, and then, but it's like a team defensive thing. Yeah, no question. It's a team thought. You know, I thought we did a tremendous job yesterday with, with the two guards from uh, from Arkansas, and, and they're pretty dynamic with their ability to score. Um, you know, Aaron and Aaron and Kamar took on the bulk of the assignment, but it, it, there was a team thought to it because you, if you're going to sit there and guard, you know, Carson Edwards uh, one on one, good luck. Um, he, he's too good for that. And you know, but you can't over help. I think that's the challenge with them. They're 40 percent from three at multiple positions, and so. You can't overcommit uh, two guys onto the ball, but you have to be there because if he's just looking at one defender, uh, he can attack one guy, and he's really good at that. Tom Davis, Fort Wayne News Sentinel. Coach, um, the narrative is they'll just replace Haas with Matt Harms or maybe the 6'10 Taylor kid, but what if they go small with Vince at the five and move Nogel into the lineup? What defensive challenges does that present if they go small and they have five guys that can – Sp spread the floor and shoot and drive and handle and all that. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, you know, you got to think that way. If if uh, Haas is not available for certain, um, and I think um, probably Creighton would be the best reference point for us. Uh, Providence has done that in our league where they play uh, Bullock and just go small. Um, and the decision you have to make on, on our side is, you know, are you going to match it or are you going to try to play advantage basketball with, with your post? Um, and we had to do some of that in the Creighton game. Uh, so we've got something to draw on there. Uh, and that's kind of a game time. I think we've got to prep for all of it uh, and make make a game time call You know, as you're in the moment and see what's best if, if they do do that, um, how you're going to counter. Stacy Clarity, going back. How are you a different team than the first time you played these guys? Yeah, I think we are. Uh, I think that's a, it's a great uh, observation. You know, I think we, we are a lot more fluid offensively um, you know, at that point in time, uh, it, it was pretty choppy, uh, and that was one of our worst games. Now, a lot of that was due to, to Purdue's defense. Um, and, and then I think defensively, we've gotten a lot str stronger, uh, a lot more solid, a lot more aware, uh, a lot more connected on that end of the court uh, where we've had, you know, from, from that point on, once we got into Big East play, um, we've had some really solid defensive performances. Uh, and guys have good clarity, you know, a lot more clarity at this point. I think Kamar Baldwin specifically um, during that time, he was transitioning uh, and kind of learning, you know, on the fly where um, you look at him last night, uh, he's got a really good command of the court. Um, he knows what he's looking for. Uh, and that was due to us simplifying some things for him. You know, I was probably overcoaching at that point. Uh, and then him, you know, studying and, and growing and developing. Thank you. Our next press conference will start at 310. It will be Michigan State. At that time, their locker room will also be open.
Michigan State student athletes are currently on their way, which means their locker room is now open. Michigan State today is in the visiting NBA locker room, which is down the hallway to your left. Reminder to everyone, same as previously, uh, no flash photography, video recording must be done through the distribution site in the back of the room, and media members are reminded that they should identify themselves and direct uh, questions at specific student athletes. You can also continue to find these uh, transcripts at nca.com slash transcripts, or we'll send them out at the conclusion of uh, these press conferences as well. Student athletes that are not currently available in the press conference are in their locker rooms at this point for the next 30 minutes uh, until our press conferences conclude. Joining us will be Miles Bridges, Tum Tum Nair, and Cassius Winston. And then Tom Izzo will follow at 3.30. Welcome. We'll take questions for the student athletes. Larry? Larry Lage, uh, AP Cassius. How do you try to um, discipline yourself to go for singles? You talked about last night. You know, you like to go for home runs. How do you try to, as the games get bigger, settle for singles or be okay with singles? Uh, you just got you got to keep it in your mind. You know, you got to focus on that a lot of times. So you know, sometimes you let the game get to you. So you you think there's something that you can make a play. So if you if I just keep it in the back of my mind and focus on it, you know, make the easy play, make the simple play, then that problem will be fixed. For any or all of the players, just wondering how. The 16 over the one upset last night, how much you guys, how much that impact you, how much you think about that, how much uh, that confirms what we know about this tournament in your guys' minds? I think it confirms a lot about what goes on in this tournament. You know, just anybody can get beat, you know, and uh, you just got to focus in it and make sure we do all we can to execute our game plan. Uh, I would say that's why they call it March Madness. Um, every team here is good. Um, you can't take any plays off. Good on to the Pine for Sports Illustrated for Kids. I'm just like I am today because I'm proud of who I am and where I'm from. Each one of you, what are you guys proud of for who you are, where you're from, and about this team? Good question. Uh, you know, I believe I believe I'm from the greatest city in the world. You know, Detroit. Uh, I'm very proud of it. You know, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Uh, it's a tough place, and it's a lot of love and support. Everybody there wants to see you succeed, so I'm very proud of that. And I think this team is the same way. You know, we're all together. We all want to see each other play at their their very best and see each other succeed. Uh, I'm very proud of where I'm from. Um, I wouldn't be the man I am today if I wasn't from Flint. Um, they instilled a lot of toughness in me. Um, it made me mentally ready for college. Um, I'm also proud of where I'm from. You know, just. Being a kid from Nassau, Bahamas, you know, um, moving to America when I was 13 years old, 10 years ago, um, you know, like Miles said, it made me into who I am today. Um, and I wouldn't be the person I am today if I wouldn't, you know, have born in the Bahamas. And I think, you know, with this team, you know, you have so many players from different places um, growing up all across America and, you know, coming together for one common cause to be the best we can be every single day and help each other live out each other's dreams. And I got to follow that up. <laughs> Rico Beard, Spartan Beat, 92-1. Guys, how, uh, with such a quick turnaround, how challenging is this Syracuse defense for you guys? Um, we, we struggled um, with zones in the past, um, but I feel like we moved the ball better now and we're more experienced with it. So if, if we don't let them speed us up, I think we'll be fine. Uh, yeah, there, uh, it's, it's a long, it's probably the longest zone. You know, you're probably going to play. Uh, 
So if we we got to do a great job of limiting turnovers, can't let them let them get turnovers. Yeah, got to keep the ball moving, make make smart plays. Just to follow up, Miles, to what you said, can't let them speed you up. Does that mean you have to be patient, not take quick shots, the first shot you see over the zone? Uh, I wouldn't say that. If we, if we have an open shot, we have to take it because we're not guaranteed another open shot because um, the zone is so long. Um, so we just have to make – when I say getting sped up, I mean like making bad passes or cross-court passes, any, any other type of stuff. Cassius, what do you know about uh, Frank Howard's game so far uh, in the Sky Report? What do you have to respect about him? Uh, he's a, like I said, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a big guard for sure. So he's going to, you know, he's going to be able to create a couple shots. Uh, he's hard going right, and he can shoot the ball pretty well. Got pretty good range and a good athlete. So we got to do a good job of balling him up, you know, force him against his tendencies. Can't let him get any, you know, set up threes or anything like that. Make every shot tough. Additional questions for the student athletes? This one's for Cassius. What is the unique responsibilities for the point guard going up against a zone like this? What is your main priority? Uh, just to make sure our, our team doesn't, you know, get impatient, you know, make sure we're playing with a lot of confidence, you know. It's, it's going to be times, you know, a zone like that can be frustrating. So I got to do a good job just keeping everybody together, keep our heads together, you know. And we're going we're gonna to do a good job of moving the ball and getting quality shots. Like everyone said, the uh, Syracuse defense is tight. Anything you're going to do, like get out um, and start aggressive from the beginning? Uh, yeah, we're just going to try to move the ball around, um, find open spots, find open shots. Um, just, just don't let them settle in the zone, because that's, that's what really helps them. Jack Ebling from the Team 92-1 in Fox 47. Only one team smiling on April 2nd, but what's the lesson with what happened for Isaac Haas yesterday and Virginia last night that you carry forward the rest of the tournament? Oh, man, it's, it's, I think the lesson is, you know, you can't take any day for granted, man. Just, you know, even apart from basketball, you just, if you, if you live to see another day, you got to attack that day with everything you got. And uh, I'm just, I'm praying for Isaac because, I, you know, him being a senior, um, you know, his last ride, his last go around with that team being a, you know, a very senior oriented team and, you know, it, it sucks to see him go down. Um, and with this tournament, you if you're in this tournament, you just got to be thankful that you're in it and, and try to survive in advance. So I think, like I said in the beginning, it just helps you to have a, appreciation for life in itself. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, like I was telling Miles the other day, you know, one, one of these games are going to be our last games of the season, you know, whether it's a championship game or anything like that. So every 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 opportunity you get to go out there you know it's one of those games could be your last so you got to tackle that like you know it's the last chance you have Dalton Scheller with the Spartan Sports Network the bench has been such a strong point for you guys throughout the season you go into this game against Syracuse where they have three guys that play at least 38 minutes per game and the Orange have played three games in the last five days is the bench a huge X factor for you guys going into this one yeah um we would like to get in transition um like I said don't let them set up in that zone because that that consumes some of their tiredness. So we just want to move the ball around, get in transition, um, kind of get them tired or in foul trouble. Further questions for the student athletes? All right, guys, we'll dismiss Thank you back to locker room. Thank you. Locker room remains open for Michigan State. They, again, are in the visiting NBA locker room. And then uh, head coach Tom Izzo will be here at 3.30.
Coach, welcome. Great. We'll get started back up. Michigan State head coach Tom Izzo joins us. The Michigan State locker room remains open for just a couple more minutes, but we'll let Coach begin with an opening statement. Well, excited, I guess, is the best statement I can give. Excited to be here. It's, uh, it's good to play against our old foe, Jim Beheim. He's, uh, he's back at it. I mean, just doesn't seem to change. His uh, zone is uh, maybe bigger and uh, taller and uh, better than ever. Uh, the size that they present is, um, I think, difficult for everybody. I don't think many teams have shot it very well against them or scored very well against them. And so uh, one of the good things about our team over the years is we were able to play fast or play slow. And um, you know, hopefully we can speed up the tempo, but they're definitely going to slow it down. And we got to figure out a way to win uh, whether it's going in a slowdown game in a smash mouth game or whether it's kind of a racehorse game. So I'm looking forward to the challenge. I think our players are, and uh, see what happens. We'll open up for questions. Back here, Tom. Uh, with, with the zone coming up, and I know you got Ben a little bit of time last night, how important or what, how much bigger can his role be with – this defense you're going to face. How important well, you're is right. That that's that's why Matt. We did get him a little more time just because he's pretty solid in the middle of that zone. He really has a high basketball IQ. Uh, Xavier playing a little more has really helped uh, because he has a high basketball IQ. Um, so we feel we had different people that we can put in different positions. But the zone is is tough, man. I saw some pretty good teams watching all that tape I watched last night that struggled against it. I mean, it's. It's hard to simulate it if you had a week to do it. It's almost impossible when you have a day to do it. And I guess that's why he's been so good in the tournament also. Uh, Tom, thank you for your time. Um, looking back to your, to your games against Bayheim and Syracuse, do you have a favorite memory in, in those games or one game that stands out above the rest? Oh, there's been a bunch of them, you know. I, I remember early on we played at the Garden and and we must have had 20 turnovers against that zone. And then I remember the game at the Palace when we, uh, we were down big and we came back and won big. But one, probably one of the funnier games is, uh, I think in 2003 or four, I scheduled the world. I thought I was gonna have, I, I did have a good team, but I lost a great big guy in Rosam Lorbeck. And, and he said to me on the recruiting trail, he goes, are you crazy? Because I scheduled the world. and. And my last game of that preseason schedule was at Syracuse. And uh, he called me a better choice of words than knucklehead. You figure out what words he used. But, uh, and sure enough, they beat our brains in, you know. I, I just love uh, what he's done there. It's amazing to me how year after year after year, and even years when you don't think they're going to be as good, that defense has been. Um, so hard to deal with for a lot of teams. Um, and like last night, it was just a grind them out, find a way to win. So we've had some great games over the years. Uh, we've played a couple times in the NCAA tournament. And uh, my respect and admiration is very high. And uh, just hope we can find a way to solve it. Coach, uh, one of the first people you spoke to after your win last night was Dave Bing. I wondered if you could uh, recount your relationship for us. Well, yeah, you know, I think Dave Bing's a hero for any of us in this state. Uh, he definitely is me. I was growing up, uh, you know, he'll probably get mad at this, but I was a little kid. I was, you know, looking at Dave Bing. And, um, and then the year that we uh, played in the Final Four here, uh, you know, he was the mayor of, of uh, Detroit. And, uh, and I thought did a great job, really kind of got things back on track. And... Uh, he was very supportive when we were here. And, you know, I love the fact, like, like our Magic Johnson or Steve Smith or Mateen Cleaves, I love the fact that here's a guy, Dave Bing, and he, 
you know, he's still wearing his Syracuse orange, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, came to the Pistons, had an incredible year here, years here, and, and remained here in Michigan. So I have uh, tremendous respect. I saw him, I saw DC there, and, but I did get a chance to talk to Dave for a couple minutes. Mike Watersman, Syracuse Post Standard. Tom, last night after the Syracuse game, Jim Beheim was talking about the Virginia UMBC result and talked about how this tournament will break your heart. Uh, you've been through some of these games as well as a high seed. What is that like for coaches and players on that end of an upset? You know, I watched Tony Bennett last night. In fact, I told my, I think our media during the week that, you know, I said it's going to happen. And uh, part of me almost said, I hope it happens soon, because someday if I'm a one seed again, I think that's going to be unbelievable pressure. And that's what we talked about, right, in that one meeting. And, you know, the, the saddest part is we've had a couple times when we beat Tony, uh, our team did. And uh, if you know Tony Bennett at all, he's the salt of the earth guy. And I thought the class he handled that with and the interviews I saw was spectacular. But, you know, like our team a couple years ago with Denzel and them, um, when you got a good bunch of guys and the way he talked, he's got a good bunch of guys and, you know, you got everything going your way. But I've always said in this tournament, you've got to be good enough to be knocking on a door, but you got to get lucky. And, you know, does one injury make them unlucky? I don't, I don't know. I didn't get a chance to see him that much. But, uh, you know, uh, I give, you know, give them credit, you know. They, they did an unbelievable job and, and just the highlights I saw. But, yeah, I feel for Tony because I think his team has been knocking at that door. I mean, we beat them twice, I think, by a point or two when they were a high seed and one year they were a one seed, I think, in New York maybe or I don't know where, but... But uh, I just, my hat's off to him, how classy he was about it. The pain of it um, kind of depends on the team you have. I mean, it's always going to be painful. But if you got really good guys uh, like I had that uh, lived, eat, and slept to try to move on in this tournament and get beat in the first game, um, there was nothing like that locker room. All the joyous ones I've been in or all the sad ones I've been in, uh, that one will live with me for the rest of my life because it was a combination of incredible kids that gave me everything they could give me. We, we shot 58%. We shot 50-some percent from the three. We just got beat by a team that played better than us that night because I think we shot 54, they shot 58, whatever it was. And Middle Tennessee beat us fair and square. There was no luck. I, I tried to find an official to blame, couldn't do that. And it was just we got beat. So I feel for Tony. Rudon Gupta, applying for Sports Illustrated for Kids. And I asked this, the players this question, and I, and I wanted to ask you this. On St. Patrick's Day, I'm wearing these clothes because I'm proud of who I am and where I'm from. And I wanted to ask you, what are you proud of for where you're from, who you are, and your team? Wow. Well, I'm an Italian guy, so uh, I can celebrate any, any holiday. You know, I just go that way and I'm a youper and I'm proud of being there um, and I'm a Michigan State Spartan I've been there for 33 years and I'm pretty proud of that so um, the green fits with St. Patrick's Day uh, you know being uh, a Spartan and uh, as far as uh, my heritage um, you know I love Rocky Balboa you know I, I can keep the Italian way and uh and I guess being a youper means uh, a lot of things, but hopefully someday, uh, you know, I can put them all together. How's that? Hondo. Hondo Carpenter, Spartan Nation. Tom, you've talked about not being entitled, but your dream was to build Michigan State to an elite level where other schools are at. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are tickets for tomorrow night going on the secondary market for as much as two grand. What's that tell you about your fan base and the fact that you have arrived among the elite in college basketball? Well, you know, I, 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 I will admit that uh, 21 years, I think we've, uh, we'd have to say that we're one of the teams, you know, but um, it's measured in so many different ways and it is measured by your fan base. Um, the interest in your program, I, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's no question that, you know, the, the, 
texts and letters I got when they knew we were going to be in Detroit. So more people, I think a lot of people probably bought tickets early, hoping that we'd be here. Um, unfortunately, the fans don't necessarily win you the game, but they help win you the game at certain times, and they have. They did last night. Um, and I don't apologize for that because I played in some down at, you know, Carolina when Duke and North Carolina were there. So everybody has his day in the sun. Kansas did last year when we had to play them in Tulsa. And uh, this happened one other time 18 years ago. And uh, But I appreciate our fans. I appreciate uh, – I love coming down to Detroit. This facility is – is phenomenal and uh, the people here have been great. So um, all those things are good, but uh, still gotta win the game. And and uh, I am proud of where this program is, is you know, at. Um, I think we've come a long way and yet uh, I think we got a long way to go to get where I'd like to get. Let's go to Larry down here in front. Tom, uh, how do you coach uh, Cassius to go for singles? He talked about last night he likes to go for home runs. And your thoughts on uh, um, Syracuse point guard that you have to go up against Frank Howard? Well, I, you know, I think Cassius last night, he threw that one lob. I, you know, I didn't see what happened with Nick. All I saw is I thought it went off the other guy. I was complaining about that. I knew Nick was tough enough. And, you know, I don't know. I think he was taking his time down there. and. Um, Maybe he was a little tired on the way he bounced up. I, I said, Nick, were you faking that or what? You know, and and yet it was a it was a tough it was a tough hit that he took. I mean, if you look at it on film, I guess we were lucky. But uh, and then the other one when he threw it, kind of we had Nick in and uh, Miles coming in. Um, hey, cash is cash, but he's improved so much, so much that I didn't even get upset with him on the on the lob to those guys. Uh, I just felt like he's had 10 assists and two turnovers and done some great things. And he's going to have his work cut out for him tomorrow, though, because Howard is a very good, he's big, he's athletic. Uh, this will be a great test for Cassius, and we're going to have to guard him with multiple guys, and uh, hopefully we can keep him in front of us. I think that'll be the big key to the game. Tom, uh, Chris Collier from Syracuse.com. Syracuse Sorry. Um, I know I read earlier um, in the year that you wanted your team to be more physical. Um, how would you assess kind of where they're at now? Because they, they certainly look like they've found the weight room. Well, you know, last night was a was a night when um, I thought that that game got a little crazy, you know, a little chippy, and uh, bothered me for a while. And then I just said in the huddle, you know, maybe we need this. You know, it, it's it's about time we. We're not as physical as most of my teams. We're physically strong. We don't always play as physical. And last night, you know, and Miles was a big part of that. I think he did a, a great job of being more aggressive and assertive. And I think everybody else kind of followed around him. But we'll see, because there's some trees we're going to play against tomorrow. I mean, it is the biggest team. I sat behind the bench for a while. and. I sure as hell wouldn't want to coach that team. I'd be looking up all day long. I'd probably have a broken neck by the time the game was over. I'd never seen uh, such size, but uh, we're also looking forward to it. Wayne to 10, what was Josh doing last night that allowed him to have such a big game, and, and what, what kind of growth have you seen from him over this season? You know, Josh went from a great offensive player to a phenomenal defensive player, and I think last week, that week off we had, you know, we talked about he's, he's such a good mid-range shooter, but when he does, he's always kind of kicking his feet and off balance, and so we really worked hard on getting him to be straight up and down and get, get him to look for those threes a little bit more. He's a good shooter, but if, if you're not thinking threes, if you're always thinking driving, you've got to think shot first and drive second, if you ask me, and I think that's what he did a better job. He just looks so much more comfortable, and and, uh, and yet he did an unbelievable job defensively. I mean, that, that was the first night when I recruited him, I thought he could be the next Gary Harris. And last night was the first night when I saw it on both ends. He was very good defensively, very good offensively. And uh, Josh is going to be a hell of a player. He's, he's coming along great, and he's improved a lot since the beginning of the year, more defensively than offensively. And now he's starting to catch up with his offense. And, couldn't come at a better time. 
Tom Cristolari, Detroit Free Press. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between Syracuse's zone versus Duke's that you faced earlier and just what you saw in the ball movement yesterday that could help or needs to be a little different against the zone? Yeah, you know, I mean, Syracuse's zone is different than anybody's in the world. I mean, they just, uh, you know, Duke plays a pretty good zone, but it's, you know, I think Mike would be the first to admit that that's not his normal defense. I mean, Jim doesn't come out of a zone no matter what. I mean, I, he's played more zone defense than, than I've played man, and uh, we play a lot of man. So um, it's a system. It's a culture there, to be honest with you. I mean, you go there and you just, you're going to fit into that culture. He recruits to it. Um, he believes in it. He sells it. And he does a hell of a job coaching it. And um, so it's something that most people don't see. It's a little wider. You know, I, I think Mike, because he has some size and because Jim coached with him in the Olympic team, you know, Jim didn't talk him into doing that with the Olympic team, but maybe he kind of talked him into showing him some of the things because there, there's some similarities. It just Syracuse lives, eats, and sleeps it, and uh, that's all they play, and they play it very well. Ernie Bloom, the Michigan Bulletin. Tom, when you signed this group, this sophomore group, everybody says it's the best you've ever had. What went through your head when Josh knocks down 15 in the first half, Bridges gets 19 in the second half, Cassius gets 10 assists? What went through your head? You know, in all, in all honesty, and, and Nick doesn't get enough credit, but he started it out where he hits the first, I think, three of the first four baskets. So um, every one of those guys came through in some ways. The only guy that maybe didn't that next year was Jaron. We just couldn't keep him on the floor long enough. But, yeah, that's what you, you hope would come, and yet it's, it's not always easy, you know, when you have four or five guys like that. Uh, thank God they're all unselfish. And they're all egoless, but they also, there's still only one ball. So sometimes, you know, that's where Miles has a problem. He, 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 he'll defer because he believes in those other guys. And that's kind of a neat problem to have. But uh, it, was, it was good to see that. I, I think uh, last time I saw something like that was out at the uh, tournament we were at in Portland, uh, the Nike tournament, where... Uh, we had three different score, leading scorers, and Miles wasn't one of them. And I think that's the kind of team we have, but I think Miles is starting to realize that he's got to be that go-to guy, and we have to go to him uh, when games are on the line. You know, the one thing that has been pretty good for us is we've played in a lot of close games that upset some people, but it probably makes us more tournament ready, I hope. We've got time for one or two more. Tom, Justin Rose, WXYZ. Uh, last year when the season ended, I know you were really excited about having more big bodies coming in. Kenny Goins was garden guys last year, twice his size, basically. Going against the, the tallest team in NCAA, how much do you think that that front line and the depth of that front line can, can really sway things to help you here? Well, I hope I can. You know, uh, normally you'd, you'd try to get people in foul trouble, but with the zone they play, um, this team has not been in foul trouble that often. But just having different bodies to throw in there, uh, I mean, last year it was Kenny. Sometimes it was a walk-on 6-5, you know, and uh, that wouldn't fare too well here, you know, as it didn't against uh, Purdue in our league. So, you know, we have the weapons, but the ball's still got to go in the basket. You know, that's the way um, this game was, uh, was meant to be played. And so if you – you still got to be able to make shots. And making shots against that size and making shots against – that zone is more difficult than, um, than maybe some other ways. You know, you don't just get to attack it inside uh, before it's all over. They make great adjustments. Jim's done a great job. If you try to get it in the middle more, he makes adjustments. If you try to uh, beat it from the outside, he makes adjustments. If you're trying to go inside, they make adjustments. I think, I think he played it so much and they know it so well that there's a lot of adjustments they make. And so we've got to kind of be solid in all areas to beat them. Tom, getting back to Josh for a second, you, you mentioned Gary Harris, and I'm sure Josh has that kind of uh, you know goal uh, after, after Michigan State. You mentioned last fall, I remember, d him dealing with expectations, both that you guys had as a staff and then him for himself and maybe from the, some other places. 
How has he navigated all that this year? Yeah, you know, I, I think he's done a, a great job. I mean, once in a while, if you watch Josh's facial language, I think it's kind of like Jaron's at time, you know, as, um, you know, Josh came in with, with Miles and, you know, both of them kind of McDonald's All-Americans. And, um, you know, Miles and them are their best friends. But there's been a little bit separation between the two, and I think he had to learn how to deal with that and, and realize that there is a process, and the process takes longer um, for different people. It doesn't mean, you know, he, Josh has started here two years, and trust me when I say he's made great progress. I mean, he's defending about as well as anybody I've had since Gary, and, uh, and that's going to benefit us and benefit him but now he's starting to find his, his offense. And uh, I think it's difficult uh, when expectations are so high for yourself and your team and uh, that fine line of being selfish enough to be successful and uh, not too selfish so that you become a problem. And he's, uh, I think he's done a great job. And I think the reason he's done a great job is the chemistry you know, everybody knows that Miles and he and Tom are like brothers or sometimes <laughs> like three stooges, but they're all together, you know, and, uh, and that's important. We appreciate Coach Izzo's time. Uh, Syracuse will be here in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck.
The Syracuse student athletes are on their way, which means the uh, locker room is now open as well. They are in the visiting NHL locker room. Uh, student athletes will be here from 3:55 till 4:15, and then Coach Beheim will be here from 4:15 to 4:35. Um, just as a reminder. No flash photography is permitted. Video recording is also not permitted. Anyone looking for video needs to visit the distribution site in the back of the room. Press conference transcripts are also available at ncacom slash transcripts and will also be distributed following the conclusion of the press conferences as well. Joining us uh, for Syracuse is Frank Howard and Tyus Battle. And we'll open with questions once they arrive. Guys, welcome. We'll start with questions for the student athletes. Question for Tyrus. Uh, my name is Casey Harrison with the State News. Uh, seeing what Michigan State was able to do yesterday, you know, go up big against the Bucknell team, um, you know. What do you really know about them, and how? What is the best way to to take a defensive standpoint and stop them? Um, well, we know they're well coached. Uh, they have some really good players. Um, so they're, they're going to be a tough team. Uh, they have good bigs, good shooters, a good point guard. Uh, so they're just a good all all around team. But uh, if our zone is active, moving, we'll be fine. Um, for for kids application question for both of you uh, yesterday before halftime you allowed Butler to score a lot of points anything you're going to be doing uh, this tomorrow to stop Michigan State from scoring before halftime uh, you know just got to be active um, you know use our length use our athleticism uh, I think uh, when our activity level is high you know I think that's when the zone was very uh, effective and uh, you know, shout out to you too. You know what I'm saying? I see. You. Oh, man. Um, well, we're, we're a defensive minded team, and we know we win our games based off our defense. Uh, we um, put teams well below their average when we're playing good defense, and that's what we're going to have to do tomorrow. Larry Lee, Associated Press, question for Frank. How do you see your role? Like, what when you're doing your job for Syracuse, what are you doing? Um, and then what is your thoughts so far on Cassius Winston with what you've seen from Michigan State's point guard? Uh, I think my role is, uh, you know, to first lead the team, uh, be a leader first, uh, you know, command the offense, you know, kind of be the spark on defense as well, um, you know, kind of do whatever I need to do to, to uh, you know, help us get the win, you know. <clears throat> some games I have to score the ball more, or you know, some games I have to facilitate more. So uh, I just try to do whatever it takes to, uh, to get the win. And uh, you know, I know um, Michigan State they have a, a lot of great guards, and uh, you know, we just got to keep them on the lane. You know, use our length to our, uh, our advantage, and uh, you know, just be active. Casey Harrison, State News. Uh, for both of you, with. The, the two games that you've played during this week, is, is there any kind of fatigue or uh, mental wall, physical wall that you hit, you know, going to, to Dayton to play Arizona State and then playing TCU? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, we're a mentally tough team. Uh, we're used to playing a lot of minutes, and we're used to battling the entire game. So uh, uh, I, I don't think there's any fatigue. 
Yeah, uh, I think at this point in the year, I think, uh, you know, we're kind of used to it. It's kind of routine. Um, you know, just got to take care of our body. Uh, you know, uh, this is what we wanted all year. You know, we want to be in this position. Uh, you know, we're happy to be here. You know, we're just ready to attack. With this kind of short turnaround, is there anything special in particular, in particular that you guys do to take care of your bodies during your off days? Uh, just sleep a lot. I think, uh, yeah, getting a lot of rest, um, uh, drinking a lot of fluids. <clears throat> you know, uh, we have a great staff, uh, Brad Pike and uh, Ryan Cabillas. You know, they do a great job of uh, stretching us out, stretching us out. Um, you know. Icing up uh, after each game, and uh, you know he's got to be that's got to be smart about it. Um, just like Frank said, uh, stretch, ice, a uh, lot of sleep, and uh, just mentally preparing yourself for the next game. Anything else? Oh. Just waiting for since obviously your guys' zone is unique. Do you find opposing teams? early on sometimes get frustrated or do you kind of wear them down frustration wise over the course of a game I mean uh, if, we're, if we're playing the zone the, right, the correct way we're moving active talking uh, we definitely frustrate a lot of teams because we're just so long athletic uh, we have shot blockers down low and uh, when you finally get that open shot you start second guessing it because you haven't gotten a shot open shot the whole game so uh, it, it makes things tough on the opposing uh, team you guys have been playing a team that last night played 11 different guys. You guys play usually the whole game. I'm curious if you've thought at all about how that might affect the way that the game plays out and if you think that helps or hurts you. Uh, I think every team is uh, comfortable with, uh, you know, at this point in the year with what they do. You know, um, we we go seven deep. So, uh, you know, we're used to playing minutes. You know, the, the other team making subs is, uh, you know, nothing but a personnel issue for us. So, you know, we just pay attention to who comes in the game and, you know, uh, what they do on both ends of the floor. But, uh, you know, for us, you know, we just got to stay focused on our task, uh, you know, get some good movement on offense, uh, try to get some penetration and, uh, you know, just be active on defense. Uh, do you guys think that playing the zone helps you guys stay fresh in this sort of a compacted schedule? Shoot, uh, nah, I mean, the, the zone is, uh, is, you know, to me almost kind of, tougher than man, you know. I haven't ran, uh, played man in college, but, uh, you know, the zone, you, you guard an area, you don't guard a man, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, in, in man, you kind of got to worry about your man, you know, and help side. And in the zone, you, you might have one or two dudes in your area that you got to take care of. So, you know, uh, I think the zone, it, it's a tough thing to do, but, uh, you know, I think uh, when you get it down packed, it's really effective. Um, yeah, just like Frank said, the zone, you're constantly moving. Um, you're never stopping, constantly talking. Um, if so, and if something breaks down, you have to, the next guy has to pick up the slack and try to get to the correct area. So it's, it's, it's tough, and uh, you're constantly constantly moving. Anything else for the student athletes? Guys, thank you for your time. Thank you. Coach Beheim will be here at 415. The Syracuse locker room remains open for just a little bit longer.
coach, welcome. Thank you. We'll get started. Uh, we're now joined by Syracuse head coach Jim Beheim. We'll start with an opening statement before we start with questions. Well, we're excited to be in this game. It's, uh, it was a bat heck of a battle last night, and uh, we're really excited to be able to play again. Questions? Sorry, George from the New York Post. I'm just wondering, how did you find Merrick, and, and how difficult is it to project uh, well, he may be able to do. I've only taken one player in my career off tape, and he was before Marek. He was the worst player I've ever had. <laughs> he looked great on tape. <laughs> he was, <laughs> uh, you know, normally we don't ever even would think about taking somebody off a of tape. Um, but we we were in the summer. We lost a player late, or knew we were going to lose a player pretty late. Uh, so our numbers were 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 really sketchy at the time uh we we had got some tape and we, we liked you know what we saw we knew that he was a productive player in, on his junior team and you know you watch him on tape he's it's what he is he's quick he runs he's got a good feel for the game um you know he's one of the only european players that can't shoot that i've seen in the last few years but he's more athletic than a lot of European guys. Um, he came in, Adrian has worked with him really hard. I've tried to help him a little bit. He, we changed his shot a little bit. And he's pretty good from about 15 feet in. He makes his free throws and he's got a good touch from 15. When he moves out, he goes back a little bit to his old form. But last night, maybe because he had to hurry or something, he, the three he made, he shot perfectly. But uh, he's a really smart player. Uh, I, I, if he weighed 200 pounds, 210, he'd probably be one of the better players <laughs> in the in the country. He weighs 175, and he's a, a good player, but he gets muscled. He has some games where he gets muscled. We have a really good three-man offensive team that people try to help on our other guys, and that creates some openings for him. And he sees where those openings are. And he's been, he can be very productive in, in those open situations. And when people play him straight up, it gives our other guys a little bit more room to work out there. But uh, he's gotten better all year. But he, you know, he's pretty much what we thought coming in. Um, really knows how to play and has a good feel for the game. And uh, at the time, again, it was a necessity move. Uh, and, and the way things worked out, it became even more of a necessity move. Larry? Larry Lee, Associated Press Coach. Um, Frank Howard, uh, what do you say or do to help him uh, cut down turnovers and your thoughts on Cassius Winston's game? Well, he's cut. He started out the year at a horrific rate, and he's been really good. He's been really good um, over the you know, last half, three quarters of the season. Uh, and, you know, Cassius Winston, I've had him with USA Basketball when I was the chairman of that committee. He's a tremendous player, uh, really, really good player. But he's one of ten. Michigan State's a team you can't focus on one guy or two or three or four. You have to play the whole team. Jim, uh, could you please share some memories of when you coached against Jaron Jackson Sr. and then maybe your thoughts on his son, who you're going to be seeing tomorrow? Yeah, you know, he was a really, really good player at Georgetown. Didn't like him too much. I don't like anything about Georgetown. But, uh, you know, he was a really good player, and his son's a better player. <laughs> He's a really good player. I'm curious how you think the, the fact that you've got so many guys playing 35, 40 minutes a game affects the personality or the character, I guess, of, of this team. I'm not sure I understand that. Or do you think that they enjoy that or it affects the way that they... I've never had a player that didn't enjoy playing every minute of every game. If you ask them if they're upset about playing every minute, I don't think you'll find one of them upset. I remember I had a player once many years ago and he was playing about 36 minutes a game. His father came to me and says, you know, He's not happy. I said, what do you mean? He wants to play the whole game. <laughs> well, we're up 30. <laughs> now, they all want to play. You know, obviously, in reality, 
if you play, the, the really good players play about 37 minutes. I mean, you tell me you can play 37, you can't play 40? It's three minutes. I mean, it's not like if you're not playing 40, you play 28. You know, the really good players on most teams, Michigan State's an exception, they have tremendous depth. But the really good players, if you look at the top three players on every good team, they play 38 minutes, the top three guys. Duke, Rhode Island, uh, they're playing today. They, they play those guys the whole game virtually. They only come out when they get in foul trouble. Our defense keeps us out of foul trouble for the most part. For the most part, not always, but for usually. But uh, you no, know, players want to play, and, and as I've said many, many times, every four minutes you got it seems like about a five-minute timeout. It must be two and a half to three, whatever it is now. I can't. I I'm sitting there for at least two minutes. I know that, not saying anything. Cause they're going to get about thirty seconds worth that they're going to remember. So the other two and a half minutes is just looking around. But uh, so they get that rest. That's that's very helpful. But but there's no question. You know our players are going to be get tired at some stages. And you know a really good tired player is better than an average fresh player. You know Tyus Battles made five or six threes at the end of games this year for us to either win the game or keep us in the game. And uh, if you're really tired, you don't do that. But. It, Whenever we lose, somebody will say, well, you're tired. <laughs> we win, they're not, I guess they're not tired. Jim, uh, over here at Graham Couch, Lansing State Journal, do you rem remember when you sort of had an inkling that Tom Izzo would get the program rolling at Michigan State? I know you faced him in 2000, but did you know before that? Well, yeah, I mean, knew he was an assistant coach. I knew Tom when he was an assistant coach, and he knew the game. He was a hard-charging guy. and. You know, I knew when he took over Michigan State, he'd he'd do a great job. I love Judd Heathcote. You know, Judd was a great coach, but he wasn't the kind of recruiter that Tom would would be and has become. But uh, there was never any doubt that he'd be a great coach. He's an absolutely, you know, one of the great coaches that we've ever had, and uh, I think he's even better off the court. He's one of the nicest people I know. I've known him. I've been on the board with him. I've been around him for 40, well, cl probably close to 40 years now and from when he was an assistant. And uh, there's no guy that has better character that would, that you would want to be your head coach more than Tom Izzo. He's, I've seen countless situations where I've been around him where he always does the right thing 100% of the time. Tom Izzo would never do the wrong thing. And anybody that thinks other than that, they don't know Tom Izzo. I know him. I've been involved in stuff. You're not supposed to say things, but uh, Tom Izzo's not going to do things that aren't right 100% of the time. On the basketball court, off the basketball court. He's a great guy. He's a great leader. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, he's a friend of mine. Jim, thank you for, for your time. Uh, just going off your, your comment on timeouts, what's sort of the, the key to, to running a good timeout and, and organization-wise? Or, well, or you, you know, I think if, if, you, if they get one thing that you say, you've you had a good timeout. There's many times that we put one thing in and we're coming out of the huddle and I'd see one guy going, what, do you, what play are we running? <laughs> you got to get, you get one thing across or so. And usually you take a timeout. It's better if the other guy takes one, you don't need one. But if you, you take one, you're just trying to sit them down and get them on track. I never used to believe it really helped that much, but I think... I've learned over the years, I think sometimes, I think it does help. Coach Wooden used to say, whoever takes the first time out is going to lose the game. I'm not sure that's really true. But he was pretty smart. Jim, Casey Harrison, the State News. Uh, with Michigan State having five starters who average double-figure scoring, what is the best way for your team to, to slow down 
you know, a, a fast-paced offense like Michigan State's. Play good defense. Make them take time. Make them have to work for their shots. And then make sure we take time and get good shots on our end. Those two things. Additional questions? Team 92-1 and Fox 47. Jim, you were pretty eloquent last night talking about the Virginia situation. A lot of people have been coming at them, the team and the program, pretty hard over the last 16 hours. Yeah, there's a lot of idiots out there. I, I, I know that. When people say that uh, they would rather have had a 15-16 and 16 season than to have what Virginia had, what does that say about our sense of perspective? And what would you tell those people? That group of people, if there really is a group like that, probably are unemployed and or uh, idiots never went to school or they're really really smart lawyers and doctors that think they know everything and really in reality probably know what they're doing and know nothing else and uh, you know Tony Bennett's in my top two or three coaches in the country by far um, unfortunately in our business it's all about the tournament when you're a good team when you just get in, like now, I'm a great coach. I'm shit. I'm no better than I was two weeks ago. But, oh, well, he, you know, he won two games. Oh, wow, he must be really good. No, he, no, nothing to do with that. I've seen coaches win games in this tournament, two or three, four games, and they're terrible coaches. Things just went right. And uh, it's what you do over the course of 35 games that determines what kind of coach you are. You win 17 games in the ACC, win the ACC tournament, He's got, I think he's got one guy that, who was hurt that'll be an NBA player. The other guys are, you know, they're pretty good. They, I mean, there's a couple, they may sneak, I don't know, they may sneak in there. But uh, he's won the ACC against Duke in North Carolina of what, four or five years? I don't even know what it is. It's, like, it's, beyond, it's beyond even trying to understand it, you know, with, maybe two recruits in the top 40 and they're he's playing against 15 guys on each team over those period of time that were in the top 20 or top 10 or top five and wins come on it's one game it's one game i can no i can't but a reasonably good player on the pro tour can beat tiger woods in one game 118 home round gets he get when he was at his peak he got beat a lot this is college basketball. I saw the Spurs get beaten their first game of the playoffs one year. They won the championship. <laughs> Golden State, I think, got beaten their first game. They won the championship. I mean, it's, it's a one and done. You're off your game a little bit. Um, you know, and, and, and this, it's not that they're – like people will say, well, they're just good in the regular season. They're not good. That, that's just stupid. That's just stupid. They've. You look at every year they've lost, and I'm not going to recite the whole thing, but I mean they beat, lost to Michigan State in the Garden. Michigan State had a great team. I, I don't remember all the other ones, but I mean you play in this tournament, you're going to get beat. Pittsburgh, they didn't like their coach because he didn't win the tournament. They're doing really good now, aren't they, in Pittsburgh? I know all those people were yelling, too. They wanted him out. <laughs> they pay this guy about $10 million, and the, or they're, which they're trying to renege on, which is great for a university to do, have a signed contract with a guy, and then say, well, he yelled at his players. Well, that's 350 coaches are going to get fired tomorrow for that. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, come on. You, you, the tournament is, you know, I've lost in this tournament to, Everybody has. I looked at the list of bad losses, and I couldn't believe we weren't even on it. They were, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Mike Krzyzewski's lost. I've lost. You know, Roy Williams has lost. Bill Self has lost. Uh, Dean Smith lost. Uh, there's nobody that hasn't lost. I think you could easily make the case that Tony Bennett's way overachieved in the regular season. And they play like they probably are in the tournament. You could possibly make that case. This year is a little aberration, obviously. That was a bit. But the other losses, you know, it's a, it's a tough tournament. And uh, really good coaches, good teams get beat. 
you know, Tom Izzo was one of the best tournament coaches ever, and I sat there two years ago and watched Middle Tennessee beat him. And they played a perfect game. We beat Middle Tennessee the next game by 30. You know, we beat by 30. It's just basketball. We lost to Vermont, and the next day, Tom Izzo, next game, Tom Izzo beat Vermont by 20. It's just the game. It's a crazy game, and the tournament's a crazy thing. We all know that. We all say that, but then we don't follow through on that. If I could hire a coach in this country and I could get Tony Bennett, there would be no second place. There would be nobody in second place. Nobody. He's kicked our ass every time we played him, except we got lucky once. We've got time for a couple more. Just going back to Merrick, how have you seen him adjust to a, living in a new country, never mind the difficulties that come with adjusting? He to seems to be country. doing pretty good. He's doing well in school. He's got a blonde cheerleader for a girlfriend. He's starting on a team in the 32 in the country. I guess he's doing okay. <laughs> she drives him all over, too, so, I mean, that shit. It's almost should be illegal. Probably is. Larry, um, Larry Leach from Associated Press. Coach, obviously Michigan State's going to have a ton of fans there, but you're going to have uh, Dave Bing and Derek <laughs> Coleman. Uh, well, if I could play them, we'd have a shot, a really good shot. <laughs> we had dinner with Dave and Derek the other night, and it was always great to see those guys. They're great guys, great people. Dave Bing was my roommate in college. And he taught me how to do a lot of things that have helped me in life. He was really the most mature, uh, most well-rounded individual that I've ever been around in my life. He had a huge impact on me. I didn't. I was from Lyons, New York, 5,000 people. I didn't know who the Supremes were when I came into my room. And uh, he taught me an awful lot. Although the first day of practice, I thought I was pretty good, and I guarded him. He had 15 straight baskets against me. I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I don't know about this situation. My mom was pretty smart. She said, well, how about the other players? I said, well, they're not that good. I said, well, then you'll be okay. <laughs> Got time for two more. Moving on, Gupta, playing for Sports Illustrated mm -hmm. for Kids. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm wearing these clothes today because I'm proud of who I am and where I'm from. And I wanted to know, uh, what are you proud of for who you are, where you're from, and for your team? Well, that's a great question. Best one of the day, which figures. Uh, the, uh, I'm proud to be from Lyons, New York, a town of 5,000 people, a uh, small little town. And uh, got to Syracuse when I was 17 and didn't know much about anything. And uh, I remember as a freshman playing on the freshman team, my, one of my best friends said, well, you're, you're doing okay, but why'd you come to Syracuse? You're never going to play here. So he's still a good friend of mine today, but I do remind him of that about every time I see him. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be from Syracuse. Syracuse is a great place. It's a great city. Uh, the people are great. Uh, four months, the weather's bad, and we play basketball then. So I don't really think about that too much. But um, it's a, a great community. They support our basketball program, and they uh, support all our causes. We raise a million dollars a year in Syracuse for charity, and most coaches can't raise 100000 So we're very fortunate to be in that city. Uh, we 200,000 people in the city. And we averaged 22,000 people a game this year. That's uh, tremendous support. We have parking for 500 cars. And it gets cold. It does get cold. I don't talk about that a lot. <laughs> Jamie, it's Matt Lindsay with MLive. You have a few guys that play, obviously, a lot of minutes. Uh, Tyus said he doesn't even look at the bench anymore. He doesn't, I mean, he doesn't <laughs> even look over there. How much do you think you see that as just like a point of pride from those guys? That they're just, they, don't, they don't even think about coming off the floor. So. No, they know they're going to be out there. And, and there's a comfort to that, too. Uh, as a player, I never like to come out. You know, you, 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 know, you always want to be in the game. And you know, when I'd come out, I hope the guy that went in played bad so I could get back in. Unless it was a close game, then I might, might not do that. But <laughs> all, the play, all players want to play. They want to be 
they want they want to be in the game as much as they can and you know it's uh you know they're going to get worn down there's going to be they're going to feel it sometimes that's you got you just got to play through it and uh and and go from there that's all you can do you can't think about that you can't think about the negatives in this game you got to think about the positives and this team's been great at that uh, we shot the ball horrifically last night against Arizona State you know we did not shoot it well and you know we were able to get at the end of the day get a get the win and you know that's they've been good at that all year we've had a few good shooting games and you know we're probably going to need one pretty soon here coach we appreciate it thank your you time. That concludes our press conferences for today. Uh, transcripts will be sent out following this press conference as well. And you can find that on nca.com slash transcripts and also be emailed out shortly. Thanks so much. <laughs>